Hello, this is David Rovix hosting another live stream broadcast, which is appearing on the Facebook pages of Popular Resistance, KBU Community Radio, and various other platforms. During the pandemic, since I can no longer tour and play music for a living, I've taken to broadcasting most every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, noon Central, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. GMT. On Mondays, it's an open mic, which I call Pandemic Open Mic Mondays, which folks are encouraged to sign up to participate in at davidrovix.com slash P-O-M-M. Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, I've been interviewing my friends for the most part and sort of publicly catching up with people who I might otherwise be hanging out with physically on a typical tour if such things were still happening. On Tuesdays, however, the broadcast has an actual producer, longtime Detroit area talk show host and Fifth Estate magazine editorial collective member, Peter Werby. These days, Fifth Estate is a quarterly print magazine that has been published in one form or another since its founding in 1965. You can read the entirety of the spring issue online at fifthestate.org. You can also subscribe to the print magazine there and hear previous episodes of Fifth Estate Live as well. Today, we're talking with John Zerzant, philosopher, historian, author of many books and essays, and a regular contributor to the Fifth Estate since the 1970s. In certain circles of society, everyone seems to have an opinion about him, whether they've read any of his stuff or not. But whether you like to read or not, you can also listen to him every Tuesday on local radio in Eugene as the host of Anarchy Radio on KWVA. All the episodes are also archived on his website, johnzerzan.net. John Zerzan, glad to have you here on Fifth Estate Live. Um, okay. John, on a recent, uh, I think it was your, the last uh, of your radio shows that's uh, available on, on the website, um, you you mentioned uh, something that I just keep on thinking about for months now, about all the chickens that are coming home to roost, to use a certain phrase, right now. And... Um, which is kind of why I started doing interviews was because there's so many chickens coming home to roost. roost. It's just really too hard to even keep track of them. And I wonder if you could just give us your take on which are the biggest chickens roosting at the moment. Well, the most obvious one, I guess, is the pandemic. And we're clearly in the age of pandemics. Uh, today in the New York Times, I'm reading that uh, bubonic plague uh, struck a herder in Mongolia. Uh, within the week, H1N1, a new strain of H1N1, uh, is breaking out in China. And Ebola, about 10 days ago, they announced the end of Ebola, end of the Ebola outbreak. Same day, they had to announce the beginning of a new one. So, you know, this isn't, this is a global thing, the sickness of late civilization, literally the pathology of it all. And that's, I mean, of course, that's, that's just uh, one of the more obvious ones. The, obviously, uh, too, the uh, what's happening to the physical environment, catastrophic. That's coming home to roost with a vengeance. Uh, there's, you know, a hundred different things. I don't have to re retail them here for you, but uh, you know, the oceans are rising, warming, acidifying, filling with plastics. You know, on and on and on. The enormous extinction rate. The, it, actually, the bigger pandemic, by the way, is air pollution pandemic kills a lot more people than the pandemic is likely to kill, not to discount that, but uh, the the air on the planet, uh, you know, that's just incredible. For example, I was remembering last summer, the air in London was often worse than in Beijing. So you can't just you know, write it off as some part of the world. Uh, that's just a big, huge uh, reality. And, you know, the social fabric, let's take a look at the social fabric, especially here in America. Uh, you know, it's it's amazing how much anxiety, depression, suicides, mass shootings. I mean, the whole thing is, is so scary. And it's just the backdrop of everyday life, of social existence. It's just becoming more tattered all the time. And of course, all these things are tied together. That's the, the totality is you can't really uh, pick up one without uh, noticing the links uh, throughout, you know, the, the way all of this is interdependent. 
it's i mean when you when when if you just read any news report of of some, of some kind of global recap of what's been going on over the past few days and i mean this has been true for a long time but it just sounds so biblical kind of like you know fl if floods famines plagues i mean it's it, and and yeah it's just uh we are we're in this age of pandemics you call you as you as you refer to it as the age of pandemics age of extinction uh, it's uh it's uh, it, it, it's pretty pretty bleak stuff overall isn't it yeah yeah it's uh i mean i know this is the sort of question that that that, uh, that, that, that typically interviewers like to ask at the very end but I, <laughs> let's, can we just uh, you, you know you t you write about the about how much more depression and anxiety and there is in society, and this is this is something that is being talked about in in mainstream circles now. I mean, a lot of the things actually that you've been writing about for a long time are now being talked about in mainstream circles. I don't know if this is something you're noticing over the past few weeks, but it's like the whole conversation is changing in a lot of ways. Would you say? I mean, this is it's kind of interesting. Well, yeah, I, I find that pretty hopeful, or at least signs of that. Uh, not as much as one would like, but yeah, that that is coming to pass. For example, the uh, the the future of cities, the nature of cities, is on offer really due to the pandemic, because it's all about density, as and it has been since domestication. That's what domestication is, and that's why infectious disease starts with domestication slash civilization. So you start seeing. Some people, anyway, are seeing the depths of this crisis, you know, and, and the roots of it. And, you know, I I'm more, I guess I'm see, noticing in particular in the anti-authoritarian milieu uh, more zines that are pretty specifically anti-civilization, uh, green anarchy, if you will. And, for example, in the past few days, there was a note about a new one from Ireland and this is the second one in Ireland, by the way, that's uh, green anarchy oriented. En real, I'm probably horribly mispronouncing it, but uh, you know these things are popping up in our own circles, and that's uh, it's about time that the red anarchism got off the uh, got out of the picture and uh, out of the way. For example, <laughs> the rollout here with this new zine that I mentioned here from Ireland. There's a poster as part of the rollout, and it says, whose streets, no streets, you know, tear up, roll mm. concrete. In other words, there's the difference right there. Not that these other struggles aren't important, but, you know, what is more basic? Are cities viable? Do they have a future? Of course not. But uh, so now we're getting to that place, I guess, slowly anyway. That is a that is one. I mean, as a songwriter, that's a wonderful slogan. I'm going to have to do something with "Whose Streets No Streets," and "Whose Streets Our Streets" is a wonderful uh, sort of uh, comparison between the two concepts. But at the same time, like uh, another thing that is being really, I mean, it's a lot of people are widely criticizing uh, the capitalist system specifically as a form of industrial society that is particularly incapable of meeting the current moment whereas other societies that are less dominated by corporations uh seem to be at least somewhat more capable of dealing with the pandemic anyway and and, and kind of sort of keeping keeping people housed and and fed uh while they're quarantined for example i i just i I don't know where this is going necessarily, but I just wonder if you have any any uh, thoughts on that in terms of the different kinds of uh, industrial societies that are currently being questioned right now. Well, yeah, there are differences. And, you know, sometimes we, uh, to use the word we, are criticized for not talking about capitalism enough. But I, to me, I think that's, there's not much more to be said about capitalism. I mean, to, it's kind of obvious. And uh, that is certainly, uh, you know, that's problematic, obviously. That's just another phase of capitalism. And I don't think the differences should be exaggerated, though, by the way. I mean, you can have, you could easily have a socialist government that has no problem at all with civilization or industrialism or domestication, and they're fine with streets, you know. That's, but, but yeah, it's not that there are no distinctions. You know, there's, uh, there certainly are. 
I wonder if, uh, do you have any thoughts on the global happiness index that comes out every year? Because uh, I mean, you, you, you write about the social alienation of people in modern society and, and, and many other societies going thousands, get back thousands of years, but every year this, uh, the global happiness index comes out, you know, and they study people and however they do it in 156 countries. And it's always, uh, several Scandinavian countries at the top. And I, I don't know mm -hmm. if this is, uh, any thoughts on that? Is, this, is that something you've, you've uh, paid attention to? Well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of confused by that. It, it always strikes me that uh, one can be personally happy. For example, I'm personally happy, but, you know, I'm, I'm not in the dark as to how uh, horrendous things are, you know, at large, uh, macroscopically. I mean, it's, in other words, those are two different things. And it's, it's really hard to get much out of that, it seems to me. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a fairly happy, optimistic, uh, satisfied person, but that doesn't mean that, you know, again, that I don't see the, the, uh, the horrible reality out there. I mean, so what, do you, what can you make of that, whether, you know, in terms of one's, one's subjective uh, feelings and, and the rest of it is two different things? It's it's more about uh, perception or or how people perceive their uh, lives to be according to this, uh, which then begs the question: What do they imagine life? Are they imagining how life could be so different than it is? Or because I mean I, I don't know. I spend a lot of time in Scandinavia as a song as a touring performer, and uh, you know that the idea that it's a happy society. Well, yeah, compared to many other societies, that kind of I can see that compared to societies where there's a lot more poverty and hunger and that sort of thing. But at the same time, it strikes me that most people in Scandinavia, just like most people here, spend a lot of their time being really lonely and alienated from humanity and, and staring at screens and, and and not particularly happy. But I guess it's all relative. Huh? Well, yeah, and it's, and it's how you phrase the question, too. I mean, it's possible to sort these things out. And yeah, there's there's alcoholism and suicide and so forth. I mean, I, I'm not, uh, Alice's uh, people are uh, Norway, Norwegian, so I've been there a little bit. And, uh, but yeah, as you say, it's, is it, is it very different there? I mean, they, they do have certainly much more of a social net than some other countries, exceedingly more than some other countries, but, but on the regular day-to-day -day life thing, it's, uh, I think you're right, it's, it's not that much different. Evie, just as a as a little aside, since you mentioned Alice and Norway, I, do you do you have much connection with with uh, the Czech Republic? Both your parents are of Czech extraction, is that right? Yeah, yeah. No, I don't. Uh, we were in Brno, where Freddie Perlman was born uh, two three years ago, and that was it was very cool. It's a film festival thing, and uh, but no, I'm uh, yeah, both sides of the family. One. One is Mor Moravian and the other is Bohemian, but you know those are the two parts that make up what's now called the Czech Republic. But I, I don't have any any real context there. No. There's one of the folks viewing this uh, conversation on Kebu's uh, Facebook page, uh, who, who uh, runs Kebu's social media uh, uh, sort of. Um, you know, operation um, mentions that is, is basically thanking you for for writing about the uh, the calendar and uh, various other things. But I wonder if, if you could uh, talk about time and and what the role of of time and and timekeeping has been in in uh, in terms of further oppressing uh, humanity. It's uh -huh. a big question, but I know it's one you've written about a lot. Yeah, it's always intrigued me. I always think of that uh, quote from Augustine. Well, I know perfectly well what time is, unless somebody asks me what it is. I mean, it's the materiality of it. It's the, it's the, when time turned into a thing, and you can just chart this, uh, not only industrial time, but I mean, all the way back, I guess, really, you can, it, it's just another way of measuring alienation. I think it's, maybe that's a crude way to put it, but I've always, it always occurs to me, I always run into that. The time consciousness is uh, is pretty much a measure of, of estrangement, of alienation, and we don't know that you know at some point hunter gatherers had zero sense of time, 
it wasn't it wasn't a symbolic dimension it wasn't a it wasn't a concept it wasn't a reality however you want to put it uh but i think that's you know from the anthropology it's it's pretty clear that relatively that's so now of course time stands over us as a thing is what could be more obvious it just you know it's an oppressive force that that rules us and, and more and more and more it's just a, a function of uh the movement of of the whole thing of of uh and it breaks out uh more and more as as it progresses you know it becomes more and more uh intrusive and determining you know mm-hmm. it's maybe the first symbolic dimension of all you know when that starts to enter the picture we're removed from from immediacy insofar as we uh we have that sense of time hard to get away from it now you know i used to work in the fields as a kid during the summers and we were we were fairly near this installation that had a uh, a steam whistle at noon when we could knock off and have lunch and i as a kid i i found myself able to guess when it was when the whistle was going to blow within seconds i was mm. so uh trained <laughs> so conditioned by and i thought wow how wonderful how how cool i am and then of course later i thought man what a complete hostage to time if you're if you're that uh, calibrated by it it's it's crazy it is i ever since the pandemic hit and i've become even more of a news junkie than i was before I actually wake up on the hour at five o'clock every morning mm-hmm. because uh, because I want to hear the headlines. It's just uh, it's it's a bizarre uh, reality, but yeah, yeah <laughs> my, right. my mind knows what time it is. <laughs> right, you know, nobody can step outside of it. I mean, unless the total culture is transformed, that would be the only way to get out of it. Otherwise, where you can, you know, zone out or whatever, but it it's there. It's there. There was this uh, something I read recently. I guess I, I don't know how much of uh, the archaeological. It, it sounds like from reading 1491, uh, this book uh, by Charles Mann. It sounded like a, a lot of the. Uh, there's been a lot of archaeological stuff that has been learned by archaeologists archaeologists over the past few decades using soil analysis techniques that d- apparently didn't exist before. I'm just judging. Ju- I'm just repeating what he said. I have no idea. But um, one of the things that 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 they said they know now is that 12,000 years ago, uh, human the human mind, uh, the human brain was 15% bigger th- than it is now. And it's that's just so striking that and I wonder, that, I mean, in your broad take on the history of the past uh, 12,000 years or so of, of uh, parts of the world and ultimately most of the world uh, becoming agricultural so civilizations and all this has it been a, a, just a, a, a downward trend Are things moving in the wrong direction consistently or has it been more of a roller coaster well you see what what gets it going was is domestication the massive uh, epical shift from hunter-gatherer life to that of domesticators it all changed almost overnight after you know we were we were likely cooking with fire two million years ago, and yet it was only, you know, like you say, ten thousand years ago or less that uh, that it all changed and introduced all of the problems, all of the, you know, war, cities, uh, you know, the whole shebang, the, the tendency toward uh, the religious escape, and you know, a million other things that did not exist before that. For, you know, you think of the pandemic. Well, for for instance, it, it makes me think that, or it reminds me that infectious disease and degenerative disease, that was brought about by domestication. Neither existed before, before that. That's kind of staggering. Yeah. You mentioned the brain. Well, Neanderthal brain was much bigger than ours, much bigger than Homo sapiens. That in itself doesn't necessarily tell you a lot, but I mean, what I go back to all the time is the capacities we we find this more and more in the literature how much uh how capable people were at earlier and earlier ages i mean it's just kind of remarkable well before the symbolic well before 
symbolic culture, no trace of symbolic culture past maybe 30,000 years ago or something like that. But, you know, living in banned society and face-to-face -face society without domestication, you know, in, in a state of eros and freedom and so on. I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing. It's the way to kind of undo all this thinking, you know, all the, all the sort of comic book figures uh, about, you know, brawny, stupid people uh, dragging the woman into the cave and dying by age of 25, all these nonsense things that are just really comic book ideas. And yet, uh, you know, when you, when you take a look at it, it's, it wasn't like that at all, as far as we know. I mean, the evidence points in the opposite direction. Like, for example, just one, one instance, in Germany, they found these fossilized hunting spears, wooden spears, very long, heavy spears. Usually never find that, uh, you know, it's, it's petrified wood is what it is. And um, unlike stone tools, it doesn't last very long. You're not, you're not gonna like, you're not gonna find uh, other kinds of tools from horn or from wood or from very likely, you know, it all disappears. Well. These hunting spears were perfectly balanced, you know, just remarkably so. I mean, they weren't just some sticks that somebody was going to pick up and toss. No, they were the, the heft of it, the balance of it. You know, that, that wasn't, that, that was a conscious thing. I mean, that was, that took some brain power 400,000 years ago wow. and probably earlier than that. Anyway, 400,000 years ago, 400,000. So that's um, before... Uh, Homo sapiens were in Europe, right? Oh I, yeah, yeah, well before. Yeah, we're yeah still have Homo erectus and other Homo species, but uh, yeah, uh, but they knew how to do all these things, and maybe you know gives pause to when we <laughs> when we think about how wonderful we are, how smart we are. It's uh, you know we we're, we're so de skilled now. It's it's that's just a remarkable fact. We can do things on the screen or something, but. Uh, you know, what happens when we're going to have to do something in reality? You know, it's all these skills that we've lost that we've just been pitching aside. It's like, I mean, it's one thing to have the knowledge of like the Encyclopedia Britannica in terms of local herbs. Like they say, the average person in the uh, indigenous person in the Amazon has the as uh, it could if if their knowledge of herbs and and plants were written out, it would take volumes and volumes. But like, uh, there's also, I, I want it, 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 it just in my own lived experience, I feel my brain deteriorating like physically, like it's almost like I could, I, I'm sure if it were measured, it would be smaller than it was 20 years ago. Cause I, I'm completely dependent on GPSs. I have no ability to find my way anywhere. Although I love the fact that I don't, you know, as a touring musician, I no longer spend about four hours every week, hopelessly lost in some city I've never been to Incre incredibly frustrated. I'm, I don't miss that at all, but my brain is, I mean, my ability to find my way out of a paper bag is, is seriously hindered now. And I'm totally GPS dependent. And the same thing happens with memory. Like uh, now I, I can have lyrics on an iPad. I can do a song that I just wrote last week much more easily without having to remember it. But then I start forgetting a lot of other things. And then I, I, with the, when the printing press came around uh, 500 or whenever years ago became popular, that must have had such an impact on oral the oral tradition. I want, you know, so many of these things, we just, they're just spun in this positive way, but I'm not sure, you know, it's, they're mostly negative, it seems. I wonder if maybe even including the printing press. Oh, agreed. Yeah. These, these dependencies, they, they narrow our life are, uh, and now, you know, direct experience itself is going away. It just is. It's all mediated. It's all in the screen. It's all these different ways that we live in this synthetic, uh, zone and it's just uh and it just goes step by step i mean it didn't happen overnight as you point out you can you can go well back and, and i mean, plato pointed out writing is going to take away memory because we won't need it we'll just write it down and then you know apply to it later but yeah all these things uh, they just narrow life they don't expand it and now of course you have the claims and promises of technology writ large from all sides every day, how we're much more connected all the time, which is a fabulous lie. We've never been so isolated and disconnected. The machines are connected, but are we really connected or 
you know, are we more empowered? Well, we've, of course, we're so disempowered, it's, it's pathetic. And, you know, all these, all these mammoth lies that, you know, the wonders of technology, it's going to just keep getting better and better. People are less and less healthy. Gee, I thought, it, you know, I mean, anywhere you look, it's, it's just the opposite, virtually, of, of all of these things that are said. But if you bombard people enough and are already dependent on, on the whole thing and, and devices and, you know, staring at the screen all day, I mean, you know, then, then they're more prey to just keep uh, going after that. You know, well, I guess I got to get a new this and that. And, you know, that's the, that's the world. You know, that's the reality. And that's how it's defined. And, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. There's always some some kind of uh, thing that attracts people to the idea, and then the actual reality is is very much different from the, the what what attracted to them them to it in the first place. I mean, it's uh, partly the the situation with the pandemic, especially, and all this uh, use of these uh, supposedly connected technologies becoming so much more popular than they were even a few months ago. And like I've interviewed a couple of people who. You know, they, the benefits of being a pan-Africanist and not having to travel to Tanzania to have a meeting with folks from Ghana, the U.S., and Britain, you know, that that's kind of obvious. It's m maybe nicer to have it on Zoom, but uh, that, that you lose so much in the in the process. Huh? Yeah, and there, there's a lot of specific things. I'm just thinking of one in particular uh, through uh, the Internet. Uh, all these social movements and stuff like Arab Spring, man, you could do all kinds of stuff, organize all these activities and make it happen. Well, it turns out that's not the way it works. No. Certainly you can share information. We all do that. I mean, th there's got to be something <laughs> worthwhile in it or nobody would bother with it at all. But, you know, in other words, it's a very thin connection. It doesn't cause people to do things like get out in the streets and confront the cops or something. That's, that's just not... That, that it's not uh, it doesn't do that it just doesn't and then now you you read these studies after the fact and wow I guess it wasn't quite that simple that more technology means more movement no it's been the opposite people are more uh, you know they do less because it's all virtual anyway you know you just you don't have to go there as you say you don't have to go to Africa you can just or you you can have a virtual petition or some crap like that as if that makes any difference, you know, just a lot of, uh, a lot of hot air, which is, you know, pumped at people all the time. So of course it has an impact. Yeah. You're listening to Fifth Estate Live, which comes to you every Tuesday on various platforms, including the Facebook pages of Popular Resistance and KBU Community Radio. You can find all the episodes archived in audio form at fifthestate.org, where you can also subscribe to the Fifth Estate print magazine. We're talking with philosopher and historian from Eugene, Oregon, John Zerzan. And one of the things... Um, that really struck me about uh, that, that you've written about, which is like one of these many, many um, historical episodes that it tends to be dismissed by the various elements of the left and the right and so many other uh, folks in society. And I'm thinking specifically of, of the, the Luddite movement in the early 19th century in, in England and, and also so many other movements that get characterized as utopian. Uh, that 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 get dismissed as utopian. Uh, like utopian is just a word to dismiss people with, right? Is that is that how it's generally used? And I I if, so. if you, you talk about that a bit, would you? Well, the Luddite thing—that's uh, another uh, to me. Uh, I think there is uh, there is a Luddite sentiment uh, afoot, and you know we've got to make it more real, uh, certainly. But I mean, I remember in the mid '90s, uh, I'm thinking of the Unabomber case. And I was surprised, I was, I was amazed at how many people actually did, uh, that That did resonate with people. For example, Alice once taught briefly at the business school here at the U of O, and uh, she ran into a friend from there who's teaching at the business school, and there was the some, somewhat slightly iconic picture of Kaczynski being led out of the jail in Montana and he's kind of looking up at the sky and he's got these guards all around him. And she said, looking at that photo, why don't they just put a cross on his shoulders? Hmm. And I was, I was amazed. This guy is the mad, psychotic 
murderer of people and everything. And here's this business school professor saying, uh, comparing him to Jesus. I mean, I don't want to make too much of that, but, you know, when things got starting to get interested in the 90s, it was, I was noticing kids, um, well, let me put it this way. I, I refrained from reading uh, Industrial Society in the Future because I, I was afraid it might not be too good and I, I didn't want to be disappointed. Anyway, people said, you haven't read it, read the damn thing. It's 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 great. And, you know, and I think it is. I think it is. But, uh, but I used to run into anarchist kids here and they, it was like, oh, we know all that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Now, that's a damn awful thing. Yeah. They're, they're ahead of the game. You know, it's, it's out there. I mean, to some degree. And people are not happy with the technology. I mean, it looks like maybe people just have become zombies or in love with all these devices. Well, you know, they're not that happy. They're bored to tears. But but yet, what else is there? You know, that's the age-old question. Right. What do you got? What's the alternative? And the alternative is not too easy to bust out from that and just, you know, do away with all that. That's just a, a nice tall order, <laughs> you know, an, an enormous thing. So anyway, one has to count on that, I think, or at least uh, I do. Uh, that it's, uh, you know, the system is not having a, a totally untroubled sleep. They must know that uh, the elite install this shit is not very profound. It's not very well grounded. You know, it's not, I'm not saying it's going to blow away next week, but, you know, uh, look at what's going on now, the anti-racism upsurge. It's wonderful. I mean, it's, that's, uh, that just, some degree, came out of nowhere. It's, I mean, there's been racism forever, and, and yet, man, it's taken off, and it's still going strong over, well over a month since the murder in Minneapolis, all over the place, not just the U.S., that's for sure. Right. And it's like, I mean, it, it at the moment, as people are looking around themselves and seeing what's happening, it all seems like almost predetermined. Uh, but but if you think about it, like with the, all the, for example, children being separated from their parents at the border and any number of other just horrendous atrocities being committed against large groups of people in this country, uh, this upsurge that we're experiencing now could have happened in any number of other ways. I mean, the powder keg was a powder keg, but who knew what the spark was going to be? It could have been any number of things. Huh? Yeah, it seems like it's always that way. Yeah. Uh, History-wise. I mean, the biggest one of the, the things to me, since I'm old enough, the 60s, mm -hmm. that came out of nowhere. I mean, it really right. did. There was a civil rights movement, you know, the freedom riders and so on, but there wasn't much else. It was just a happy conformist uh, over consuming 50s right up until the middle of the 60s. And Marcuse wrote uh, One Dimensional Man, 64. You know, he pretty much said, probably nothing is going to happen. People are just, uh, <laughs> they've been reduced to just almost nothing. Well, in a matter of months, he had to kind of take that back. He was overjoyed to take it back when things started going up all over the world. Of course, it didn't go far enough, but I mean, that was an incredible upsurge globally. Yeah. There and and then people took to talking about the movement in in a way that was that always struck me as, as when I was very young and I and I heard the term the movement. I mean, I was, I was born in '67, so I, I wasn't really there in the '60s, but I was very much in, growing up in the shadow of the '60s and and among older people who who talked about the movement and without ever defining it, and it didn't seem to me need need to be defined. It was just this. Uh, this umbrella term for for sort of actual resistance. Did you use the term the movement back then? Oh yeah, you you one served the movement. I mean, it took me a long time to dispense with that concept. You know, that's you know partakes of mass society all too much, of course. But uh, you know, I was really formed in the sixties, and yeah, the movement. I mean, it's just understood. It's it's all these things that have come together. And this momentum that's going forward and gives people hope and things, you know, something's in the air. And but what do you think in you terms hear? of the the way that they used to use the term the movement? And I'm thinking of like also the way that the corporate media is trying to paint the movement that's happening now. And and it seems to me like I, you know, without wanting to dismiss at all the extremely important aspect of police brutality and institutional racism, the corporate media 
seems to be at every opportunity trying to make sure that we all frame what's going on in terms of an anti-racist movement, that it that that's what this is and that it's not something bigger than that. Because if it were even bigger than that and encompassed more than you know only racism, then it would be even more unmanageable and, and, and difficult to sort of contain. Uh, this is like like my my impression of where the editors are going with this, you know, guys it's it never seems to be the journalists. I mean, most of the journalists don't seem to know what was going on yesterday. So I, I, don't, you know, I don't know. Does... No, I think you're quite right. That's uh, there's that, there's that effort to uh, confine it. I think we're seeing some movement outside of that, though. You know, I probably would agree. I mean, like for example, the the statuary that's uh, targeted. It, it isn't just Confederate generals. You know, it's uh, it's Columbus and George Washington and you know, in other words, that part of it is that it's suspending the uh, focus, the understanding of what is oppressive, and and you know, it may well go further than that. You know, outside of those things, and I mentioned, you know, whose streets, no streets. That's that would be a nice next step. It seems to me. Just uh, it was only just a few months ago, I guess, uh, that the that uh, Trump uh, was. Uh, um, Deride, you know, saying, "Oh, if you're going to get rid of the Confederate statues, what's going to be next? George Washington?" And he he said it with such a self satisfied smugness, like as if uh, you know there wouldn't ever be a, a widespread uh, understanding of George Washington as a massively wealthy real estate speculating slave owner. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. And it's. Uh, yeah, I mean, one should never ask, a, you know, an, an intellectual to make any predictions. But <laughs> what, do you have any feelings about where where this might be heading? I mean, do do you see like there's? It seems like one of the things that's going on in, just in recent days, or maybe even weeks, is is this uh, this is these making making these connections. Like you hear a hell of a lot more if then statements. If Black Lives Matter, then what about housing? You know, if Black Lives Matter, what about redlining? What if, you know, it, what about the the mass incarceration? You know, and there's all there's obvious and less obvious connections to be made there, but a lot of them seem to be being made. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's it's as I say, it's, I think it's always a surprise what's uh, what's going to mm -hmm. come. But I mentioned the uh, city uh, put in uh, questions. You know, density. That's why you have a pandemic, most fundamentally. You, you, that's why you're supposed to stay at home to combat density. Well, that is sort of implies the city is the problem. That's density. That's the culture of cities is pretty pretty much synonymous with civilization. And there are already all these people saying, "Oh, you can't. You got to have cities. You got to have cities." Well, why are they why are they even troubled unless it's it is being questioned? So that gets yeah. pretty basic stuff. If we're gonna, and people are fleeing the cities, you know, uh, because of pandemic conditions, and that could go further. I mean, that's really it puts the whole damn thing at stake if we're really gonna question urban uh, life, you know. It's also it also really puts. I mean, in so many ways, it puts the whole capitalist economy in question too right with so much of it is based on real estate investment and speculation and and rent gouging and selling houses at unbelievable prices and all this kind of uh manufactured scarcity that, that none of it needs to be that way it's, it's, yeah for sure yeah this um uh, one of the things you hear a lot uh, is around this question of density which uh strikes me as just one of the many ways that the that the rich and powerful tend to try to take uh, reasonable arguments and turn them on their heads. Like when people talk about we need to house uh, all of those people who don't have anywhere to live. And then uh, the, the capitalists say, oh, well, uh, we need to get rid of uh, regulations more and, and have more housing, more density, more construction. Uh, and what, they, what they never tell you is, is their goal is to create Houston everywhere. Like if anybody's been to Houston, you know, you don't want to live in a city with no regulations, <laughs> no, where, where it's all about construct anything you want as much as you want. And, and you, know, you, you end up with Houston. But but, uh, but this is the this is their solution. It's more more and and denser, right? And you can just cannibalize this and that when when you have to. If malls are failing as widely as they say, 
well, I've heard I've heard these plans for well, we just turn it into housing. So <laughs> we just move the markers around, and uh, but it's still the same old game, that's for sure. Somebody is wondering on uh, on watching on on uh, Periscope. They're wondering about uh, what do you think of the uh, corporations uh, declaring their support uh, of Black Lives Matter, and uh, and uh, yeah, I, I have no idea. I'm not sure what they're talking about. The national organizations ties to the DNC, but uh, and and their, the DNC's effort to delegitimize the movement, but. Good, good talking points. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, you got thoughts on corporations, the DNC, and Black Lives Matter, and well, the intersection yeah. of the three. <laughs> pointed out that capitalism is infinitely flexible. They'll they'll turn anything into a commodity. One of my favorite examples was after anti WTO in Seattle, these years ago. Uh, I think it was Vogue uh, approached a number of young anarchist women, black, black women, to try to market uh, sort of punk anarchist clothing line. After people had put put themselves on the line to, uh, you know, go after it in Seattle, then they're just another, well, punk, they did that well before Seattle, but, you know, it was just so brazen that they contacted these people and uh, <laughs> they got a very unwelcome response, of course, but I mean, yeah, they're just, do anything, yeah. um, you know. That's that's just par for the course. That uh, upsurge in, in the late '90s with the the uh, global justice movement, or however you know it went by many different names, but that uh, the whole protests around the WTO and the IMF and World Bank, and that was a it was a it was a hopeful period for you as well. I know you were doing a lot of uh, at least according to some things that I read uh, that you said in interviews. Uh, you you seem to be feeling hopeful about where things were going, and you were doing a lot of uh, traveling and speaking at that time. And then it seemed like among other, there were so many different uh, forces in the, the power structure trying to, trying to undermine that movement. But ultimately, uh, it seemed like 9-11 uh, was the sort of nail in the coffin, but also put so much police brutality. And, and oh, yeah. I wonder what you think, what, what are your thoughts on that, that movement and the whole, also the well, whole idea of holding space, which was so much a part of it. Well, it was called generally called the anti-globalization movement, but sadly, I would say sadly, it really wasn't very anti-globalization. Mm -hmm. The left liked alter-globalization, just a watered-down progressive. Uh, in other words, they had no problem with globalization at all, really. And uh, it's sort of the fair trade versus free trade uh, argument, yeah, basically. No, on that level, I mean, that's uh, you know, I, I recall the. Uh, I don't know where it was, Miami or somewhere, where the typically the journalists would would go to go up to some supposed anti-globalization protester and go, "So why are you against globalization?" And the response <laughs> was almost always, "Oh, we're not against globalization. We're against corporate globalization, or we want the nice, warm and cuddly, uh, bottom-up globalization." Well. The, that's that's a position, but it's not anti-globalization, you know. And I would say you got to be a primitivist if you really are against the totalizing machine that's uh, at work all over the globe, the movement of capital and and technology that means that there's only one civilization now, in which it's so grandly failing. In other words, that was we had, uh, you know, I mean, there were people that certainly. Uh, raise the the deeper questions about what is what is this globalization thing and and uh, but it wasn't d despite the fact that there was so much energy you know at times and starting with seattle in 99 and then as you say going all the way up to uh 9 11 that was really the end of it but that's a good two years worth you know right there in genoa late july 2001 300,000 people in the streets and man, I wasn't there, but actually the Minister of the Interior in Italy blamed it on me. And I got some calls about that. I wasn't there. I had nothing to do with it. I mean, that's <laughs> that's I mean, so, I mean, there were like. Yeah, but I mean, that was going strong just 
matter of weeks before 9-11. So, of course, various people said, uh, do you think that was a coincidence, you know, 9-11 uh, put paid? Mm -hmm. It was seemed to be getting stronger, certainly in some places. I mean, they were, you know, that was a pitched battle. I was there afterwards with an Italian friend, and he was showing me all, all of the... Uh, you know, the, the sites of the battle and uh, even the part where the World Social Forum, these Chomsky types, when the, when the police drove the, the Black Bloc people uh, into two parts and were trying to drive them down to the beach where the, where the gated, relatively safe place was, it was the World Social Forum that barred the gates, that left them out to dry while the pigs attacked them. They let them in eventually, but... You know, that's just, well. <laughs> yeah. And then the big protests in Genoa, uh, actually, I mean, the biggest days of protest at that time in Genoa, I was in Germany at the time, actually, uh, in at playing at a climate summit in Bonn. And uh, there were actually about half the people who were there uh, left uh, near the beginning because this, this summit was going on. It started before the Genoa protests and ended after. And so there were about half the people who were there hijacked a train and, and went to Genoa and then came back, many of them with broken bones and extremely uh, traumatized. And um, the, um, the, but the, they were saying that the biggest day of protest was actually in Genoa was, was actually locals protesting against the police uh, because of the police brutality against uh, so many people in the prior days around the, the, the summit, which was yeah. interesting. Yeah. Oh yeah, people at the the basement of that church where people were were, were attacked and you know and broken bones and people going to prison. That was insanely brutal. Yeah. You know, so you you uh, you have a lot of uh, criticism of uh, of Noam Chomsky, which which uh, it's, it's it seems like you know it, it, I don't know. It's it, people are afraid to talk about <laughs> Noam Chomsky because it, it's too too much of a big. Uh, uh, I, you know, too much of an icon, I suppose. But um, you, uh, you, you're very critical of his uh, support for Joe Biden and and this whole uh, once again uh, saying that that the the Republicans and Democrats both suck, but we should hold our nose and vote for Biden and this sort of thing. And I wonder if you have anything else to say on this whole concept of. Uh, trying to move like save humanity one little tiny incre incremental step, step at a time by voting for the party that is slightly more wealthy than the other one which is the democrats it's the well democrats. of course that just reproduces and legitimates the whole damn system chomsky is a mild progressive it's it's sad that anyone would c confuse him with being an anarchist that's pathetic he's he's uh I mean that's that's all there is to it. He's a mild progressive, and that's that's bullshit in my view. And you know something else here. Uh, you're probably not going to be too happy with this, but there's something I feel like I'm here under false pretenses. If I don't bring this up, you might guess what I'm referring to. In 2010, you wrote a piece for a Trotskyist paper condemning black bloc militancy, saying they're the same as cops; they're doing the work of cops. I find that really objectionable. When people have the courage to risk injury in jail to go out there and, and go after, I mean, that's that's really, I'm hoping you don't feel that way now. I bet you don't say that about black bloc uh, people that, you know, burn police cars and so forth. Yeah, I I have a lot of regrets about thing that things that I wrote. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember if that was 2010, but I think you're talking about something I wrote that was published in Common Dreams, maybe? I don't know. No. It, I think I wrote. Uh, yeah, I did. I was uh, critical of of black bloc tactics in Vancouver, BC, and I wrote something about that in 2010. Oh, yeah, right. yeah. That was the occasion for it. Anyway, I just felt like I needed to say something about that, and just not pretend that. But but again, I have no idea. I'm not saying you still think that or whatever, but just uh, bring it up. In yeah, good. And but um, do you see any distinction between um, black between the sort of I mean it seems to me that one of the things that's going on now uh, with the you know what you could characterize as black bloc tactics being 
uh, happening all over the country at the same time is uh, you know the the press, the media, the pundits are constantly like, well, especially Trump and and his crowd, but many others are constantly talking about the uh, outside agitators and. Uh, which is obviously the most preposterous uh, thing you could say, because obviously, how are you going to have outside agitators when they're coming from everywhere at the same time? But no. uh, at the time that I wrote that piece, uh, my feeling about it not was I, I'm not a pacifist, incidentally. My feeling about the uh, the, the tactics uh, was not uh, that I have any problem with uh, the, the tactics. Uh, per se, it's it's a question of whether it is uh, building a movement or not when it happens in the context of a one-off demonstration in one place where people are coming from all over the continent to go to that demo. And um, it, it uh, seems to me that there's a distinction to be made, uh, which whether I put it this way or not, but it seems to me that there's a distinction to be made between uh, that uh, and what's happening uh, in more recently. I don't know if you see any distinction there in terms of, because it seems like there's a lot of people all over society who are much more sympathetic uh, to the outrage and to the tactics uh, now that they are more widespread. Well, yeah, but you know, you never know. I mean, somebody who uh, throws the first rock or whatever it is, uh, that might go further. You you can't just say, well, that was stupid and counterproductive because it didn't go anywhere. We don't know if it's going to go anywhere or not. I mean, somebody's got to step out of line first instead of just you know marching around with the with the police escort and having these parades, which never change anything. So, but it's always a it's an open question. I I think it's an open question as far as tactics. You know, sometimes. One thing is much more appropriate than something else. You you can't. You, certain times it's obvious you can't do certain things. It's just not going to work, you know. And but, you know, there's often a chance that it's going to go further and uh, you know bring on some some nice surprises and nice outcomes. And because I said before, you know, I think it's always uh, it's always surprising what happens in history. And I mean, not always to the good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Obviously, but you know, what about the question of of uh, of? I mean, I'm I'm just I'm asking this question because I I want to know what you think. I don't have a answer to it personally, just to say. But what do you? What about the question of provocateurs? Like, I mean, and the the like you saw the video footage of the Minneapolis police popping the tires of people when they thought nobody was filming them or something. I don't know. Maybe, maybe they didn't think nobody, nobody was filming them, but it seemed like that didn't get out until some days after it happened. And I know that like people in Genoa were reporting how they saw obviously oh, that this is true at all the protests. And I've seen it myself where so many people who are dressed as black block who then are clearly undercover cops, because then you see them go behind the lines of the cops and hang out with them and take their masks off. And sometimes they're not at all uh, very, uh, you know, they're not trying to hide uh, the, the fact that they're cops. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that doesn't exist. It's pretty much always there. I mean, that's just part of the arsenal of uh, of what you got to deal with when when things get interesting. It's it's not going to be some clear cut, smooth sailing deal. You're know, always going to have to deal with different kinds of divisiveness and different kinds of authoritarianism <clears throat> and uh, if you don't, you know, if you've been through any of this kind of stuff, you see that it's just a given. But that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you never do anything for fear of provocateurs. And, you know, it's funny how that's such a uh, lot of people agree with that. A lot of people retreat to this uh, police provocateur stuff, you know, including all the people that don't want it to go anywhere and just look for excuses. That was true in Genoa. My friend was there, and and uh, they were using that against the people who were fighting in the streets. Oh, that's just a bunch of – that was just put on by cops. They're saying, well, it's just a vicious lie very often. I'm not saying mm -hmm. all of this, but you just have to go past that. It's, it's like a lot of things. You just have to assume, of course, this kind, this kind of thing is going to happen. There are going to be authorities trying well, to undermine – Well, it will be there. Property destruction, that's just so counterproductive. It's just going to turn everybody off. Well, it is going to turn people off, some people off. You're going to get a hostile, defensive reaction. 
But I think you've got to go through that. You got to get. You got to try to get past that. You can't just be uh, stymied by what what the reaction from people who are not used to seeing, you know, real resistance. They're not, and it's not. That it's going to be no surprise that some of them will freak out. You know, touch my truck and I'll kill you. Kind of. You know, there's all kinds of crazy shit. But that doesn't mean that can be normalized pretty fast because you see right. that happening. Some. You know. When when things are uh, going in the right direction, that you, you almost don't even remember that kind of stuff. You know, it's just it moves on to a different stage. You know, I have to say that I agree with everything you're saying, John. And I also have to say that my own um, political evolution over the past uh, ten years. Um, and I'd love to say that it's not, uh, you know, so much based on my own personal experiences and that I had some kind of intellectual epiphany uh, or something like that. But my own personal experience with with uh, with living in with getting priced out of one city after another and living in another city that I'm currently getting priced out of uh, is um, really um, it, it's uh, it's been so illuminating to me, and actually, the the same kinds of tactics that I found uh, uh, unhelpful uh, in the '90s um, uh, now seem like now now I just I, I wonder where where is the black bloc? You know, I mean, I'm glad to see what's going on right now all over the country, but also I wish it weren't all mostly located in downtown cores because the gentrification and the uh, what's happening throughout society, the ethnic cleansing, the the, dis, the displacement of, of so many people. It is so, it is such a silent suffering that is happening for so many people. And, and then you, you do something as simple as put up a, a put up a, a flyer on a telephone pole and you can see how much hostility that you'll get for challenging the basic structure of like why is it that everybody is paying impossible amounts of money for housing and you know it seems like smashing all the corporate stores would be a very good start towards lowering the cost of housing and actually more crime of, of you know most any other sort especially property destruction would be uh, very helpful in terms of uh, countering where things are going and I know it's like a bit late for me to come to this, uh, you know, conclusion, you know, at the age of 53, but, and this has been going on for a very long time, but, it, but the, the division, the stratification of wealth in society is extremely extreme, like much more than it was when I was young. Uh, yeah. I wonder what you have, any thoughts on that? I know I just said really? a lot of stuff, but. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, those of us that are more privileged just by being white, for example, I mean, you, you got to be aware of this. You, you know, it's it's because uh, there's so much. It's it's just everywhere. That's uh, but especially uh, the people that are the most deprived and the most targeted. And in many ways, you know, it's just one tries to be aware of that. And and uh, you know, all of our ideas change. I mean, all of us have different notions and. And the realities are different, you know, it's just, uh, I don't know what's going to happen next. You know, again, there's that question, uh, where do we try to uh, focus and how do we contribute? You know, it's, but yeah, that's, I'm glad you, you brought that up. That's very true. What do you, what do you say to the, what do you say to the accusation that uh, the kinds of uh, tactics that you're advocating are escalationist how do, what, what do you, what's your answer to that word i'm not familiar with that word but Escal I, like or what is no maybe that's not the word. max maxim maximalist or i don't know but this this idea i was reading galliani uh this biography of, of luigi galliani and and it just seemed like um basically and i thought it was a brilliant book and, and i thought he was a absolutely absolutely fascinating guy but like the it seemed like basically everywhere he went he was um basically trying to foment general strikes and being accused of fomenting general strikes. And then he had to leave because they were, you know, charging him with incitement to riot. And, and this was enti his entire life was basically doing that. Well, I like that escalationist. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's up the ante. Let's go. Let's escalate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So again, the, the ideas aren't separate from, from the action. I mean, you, that's what drives the other, that's what gives some, accessibility to certain ideas. I think that happened in C after Seattle, you know, to some degree. Uh, they, they want, the media, for example, wanted to know, why would people wreck downtown Seattle? Well, there were some of us who wanted to 
you know, reply to that. And we get a chance because, because there was damage in downtown Seattle. Otherwise, you know, 60 minutes didn't come to my house for no reason. You know, in other words, you can call the tune to some degree. Or, for example, ALF or ELF communiques. <clears throat> People burn down the McDonald's. Well, then uh, the same old question. Huh, why would people burn down a McDonald's <laughs> if they haven't thought about it before? Well, here's the communique explaining why that happened, why that sort of thing is necessary. You know, then you you might have a chance to go further. When when uh, the French farmer, um, uh, you know, what's his name? When he bulldozed the uh, McDonald's, remember Bo that? What's that? Beauvais was his name, wasn't it? Yeah. That's yeah, and 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 he had huge support uh, throughout French society for doing that, which I, which struck me as interesting, like an interesting contrast uh, to to how ELF and ALF uh, are activities are often sort of, I mean, to the extent that people know about them, there's a lot of, I'm sure there's a lot of people who are sympathetic, and there's a lot of people who think, oh, that's just crazy, outrageous tactics, but. Uh, but but uh, Beauvais uh, d d inspired a real different reaction. I don't know. Do you yeah. have any comments on that? Or yeah, yeah, and we might not have guessed that that would be so resonant, but it was. Yeah, I, I recall that. In Iceland, they blew up a dam. Farmers blew up a dam, and then they all in 1970, and then they all called into the police and said, "I blew up the dam." 113 farmers called in and said, "I blew up the dam." Really, huh. and they never they never found who did it, and they never arrested anybody. And this was sort of this is often credited as being the beginning of the Icelandic environmental movement. But it it always struck me that when I heard about that story a few, few years ago for the first time, it struck me that the difference between what they did uh, was uh, and and what and other incidents of of blowing up dams w was this idea of everybody calling in and taking credit for it in, in that particular very risky way that turned out to be a great gamble. Nice. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Well, we're just a bunch of Luddites and, uh, <laughs> you know, we can't have that. No. Well, John Zerzan, it's been a great pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much for, for being on the show and hope Thanks, to David. talk to you again soon. All right. Take care. You too. And that has been a uh, thanks for tuning in to my discussion with John Zerzan for Fifth Estate Live, which you can hear every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific, noon Central, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. GMT on the Facebook pages of Popular Resistance, KBU Community Radio, and elsewhere. You'll find all of the Fifth Estate Live episodes at fifthestate.org, where you can also subscribe to the physical magazine or read the latest edition online. You can also find these interviews and my other interviews archived in various places in the Discussions with David playlist at youtube.com slash drovix and in audio form at soundcloud.com slash davidrovix at patreon.com slash davidrovix where you can also support my broadcasting efforts and check out lots of other content. Or if you look for This Week with David Rovix on any podcasting platform. I was going to be interviewing Sherry Honkala of the Kensington Welfare Rights Union tomorrow, but she is currently in the hospital, so we had to postpone that one. So the next episode of Discussions with David will be on Thursday, when I'll take us to Philadelphia for another conversation with the very busy hip-hop artist and organizer Mike Africa Jr. Remember, don't pay the rent, and don't be afraid of your neighbors. Mutual aid will get us through. See you soon. Bye for now.